Yeah, Van Vogt's World of Noé. There was something about that that absolutely fascinated me. The spirit of it or the logic of it? Well, I took it for granted that there was a logic in that book. Now, I don't know. They, they did some awfully strange things in that book. Hey, dickheads, like a pink laser beam of truth beaming from San Diego, California, straight to your brain hole. We are the Dickheads Podcast, hosted by myself, David Agronoff. And me, Anthony Trevino. And we're engineered today by Larry, a.k.a. Lang Langhorn J. Tweed. Langhang? Hmm? Langhang. <laughs> I think we should call him Langhang Ew. from now on. Langhorn J. Tweed. Anyways, we're all here. And this week's episode is sponsored by Flesh Trade, written by David Agronoff and Edward Morris. Flesh Trade is a politically charged story of 24th century crime taking place on a lawless world where our humble protagonist, Andal Shelton, quickly learns that military tactics and political power are meaningless. He resorts to a mind fuse to upload the memory and skills of a dead war hero, Colonel Jack John Stack, and fights his way through the city to save his daughter. The fuse only lasts for one night on new cock before the uploaded pattern takes over the host. With this clock counting down, Andal must battle genetically modified gangsters, dirty cops, sex slavers, underground surgeons, mercenaries, cannibals, and aliens while struggling to control his own mind with only the night left to save his daughter. Woo! All right, oh, that's... man, who wrote that? Anyway, coming to you from Grandma Press. Yeah, um, that book is available right now on Amazon as a trade paperback, but it's also on Kindle for $6, and if you're a Kindle and limited user, you can get it for F-R-E-E. -E. So, that's Flesh Trade. Um, and uh, we thank Grand Mall Press for putting out that book. Shout out to our boy Ryan C. Thomas, who runs Grand Mall Press. Yeah. So, on that note, um, we're going to have a couple different segments before we get into the main uh, part of the show, which is Solar Lottery. So, for those of you tuning in for Solar Lottery, we're on our way there. And so, the first item of note is Philip K. Dick News. Now, we're going to do this every episode. Since this is the first episode, just to know that um, there's not a lot of new news on publication. There's some new additions and things that we'll be talking about. No shit. Yes, since he's been kind of dead since 1982. So, um, most of the new news is going to be movies, TV shows, that kind of thing. And uh, But we do have one uh, book news item, which is the winner of the 2018 Philip K. Dick Book Award was announced last month at Northwest Con, and that is Bannerless, written by Carrie Vaughn. Um, I purposely don't know anything about that book because I'm going to read it. And so I'll be able to talk about it in the news section next month. But congratulations. Right yeah, congratulations to Carrie Vaughn. Congratulations all the same. Yes. Um, and I'm assuming, uh, well, like I said, I have it uh, on hold at the library. I'm going to read it really soon. So, okay. And the second piece or news item, uh, Philip K. Dick related news is... Second Variety, the short story that a Philip K. Dick wrote in the 50s that was turned into the film Streamers in the 80s, was sold. The rights to Second Variety was sold to Channel 4 in England. I think the film was in 93. Oh, was yeah, it? Yeah, that's, 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 that's in like an early 90s film. Yeah. Um, okay, so Channel 4 is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, listeners, but it's a movie channel in England. And they do produce a lot of, they did the, um, the Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams TV series. They, Which I think we should definitely cover on the podcast oh, later on. Yes, we, we intend to. And, um, they also did a TV show last year called, um, oh, what was it? Humans. They did, uh, that, or in the last couple of years, they've done two seasons of Humans, which is a very Philip K. Dick influenced, uh, show and very good. Screamers um, came out in 1995, in case anyone cares. Okay, that was so close. It yeah. also stars Peter Weller, who you may know as 
fucking RoboCop. Yes. So, um, the concept here is that they're saying, now at first when I saw this, I thought maybe it was for an episode of Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, but it's not. Uh, Second Variety has sold with the intention of being an hour-long drama, uh, 10 episode series run. So they are really extending the story um, beyond what uh, we knew it to be beforehand. Now, I have not read Second Variety in a long time. I have read the story before. I intend to reread it again because we're going to eventually do an episode based on Screamers. So. I, I actually haven't read it at all, so this will be cool for me. Yeah, Larry, you've read it? Lang yes. Lang Lang <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story. Yeah. It's a short, it, it, it's a, like most of the films that come from, from, uh, Dick's stuff, it's, it's a short story, so. Yeah. And, uh, I know they greatly expanded the idea for Screamers too, but, um, they're gonna really, um, go for it with this, with a 10, um, episode run. Um, I do know that there's a showrunner attached. I don't have a name, uh, on me right now. Um, but, uh, you know, th this news comes out a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean something's going to happen. It just means the rights were sold. If it starts looking like it's actually going to get made, we'll talk about it more. And we'll get more details. How many of Dick's film rights for his short stories do you think have been sold? Because there's a ton of short stories. Uh, I would say a great many of them, but I don't know the exact number. But that's something we could find out in the future. But I'm sure uh, several dozen. Um, yeah, it would have. And with uh, Phil K. Dick's Electric Dreams, which I've seen a few episodes of, uh, they definitely are taking shorts, you know, random short stories and turning them into episodes, and with great success too. Actually, uh, some in some of the most classic stories, for example, I know Brian Cranston appeared in the episode that was based on Human Is, which is one of the um, really crucial first stories where Phil K. Dick explored the issues of what it means to be human. And we also have movies like Imposter, which is based on a short story, Paycheck, Minority Report. And those are all um, episodes we're going to do when we get to doing movie episodes. And we are going to start between now and the next book episode, we're going to do Minority Report. So you can look forward to that. Uh, one last piece of dick news is that uh, season three of uh, Man in the High Castle was... Filmed starting in June, I think June and July of last year. And there was a three-minute uh, clip that they called a trailer that they showed at New York Comic Cons, now on YouTube. You can look it up. We just watched it again. I think most people would refer to it as a sneak peek. Yeah, sneak peek clip. It has some interesting things. One a really important thing to note about Season 3 of Man in the High Castle is they have a new showrunner, uh, Eric Overmeyer who uh, ran the show Bosch for Amazon, which I've never watched. But I've, I've never seen it, but I also have never watched Man in the High Castle. Yeah, so. and I've watched the first two seasons of Man in the High Castle, like them a lot, and it appears from this direction of the trailer that we're going into more sci-fi territory. It actually kind of looked like Fringe when they were talking about um, moving between universes, and these are all things that PKD had suggested in his notes for Owl in the Daylight, I think that's what it was called, the, the follow-up to Man in the High Castle that he had started outlining before his death. Season 2 definitely got into those issues, but with showrunner Frank Spotnitz out, the X-Files veteran who was so passionate about the show, I, I admit when he left the show in the middle of Season 2, I was very worried about where they were going to go because... I really thought he was following uh, the heart and soul of what Phil K. Dick was trying to do with Man in the High Castle. So, anyways, that trailer's up online. You should check it out. It uh, features uh, Joseph Mengele, which is kind of creepy. He, and no explosions. Yeah, no explosions. And so definitely, if you haven't watched Man in the High Castle, you should check it out. We will talk about the series I will force these two to watch it when we when we do the um, the episode on Man in the High Castle, but we've got like a year and a half to do that, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's down the line. It's down and, the line, uh, yeah. So probably by then, season three will be done. 
and we'll uh, be able to talk about all of it. So uh, that's all I have in dick news. Um, we're going to have a very short segment that we do each time called Dick Like Suggestion. And we're going to talk about other works of fiction, whether it be movies, books, or TV shows that we think are, are very Phil K. Dick influenced that people should check out. Anthony, do you have one that you want to start with? or? Well, since this segment's new to me and I didn't know we were doing it until just now, um, <laughs> not really, okay. to be quite honest. <laughs> well... We can edit that out if you want to. No, but... no, no. Leave, leave it in. Although okay. I did just recently read a uh, Solaris, and it was amazing. But that's I don't know if that really counts. Larry. Yeah, toss it over to me. Yeah, that'll work. I softballed that one to you. <laughs> that's that's true. Um, anything recently that I've seen that relates to Dick? Not off the top of my head. Not including Black Mirror. Yeah, Black Mirror is definitely influenced. Um, well, the, it, if you t want to talk about Black Mirror, then you have to talk about Metalhead. I don't. Which means that you have to talk about uh, uh, Second, whatever it was called. What is it? Second. Second. The story, the Screamer story. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Oh, you know what? Second now variety. That you bring that up, Second I variety. Even, I hadn't really thought of that. It's it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, it huh. is very similar. Um Oh yeah, Metalhead. Oh, you're talking about the episode Metalhead of Black Mirror is definitely very uh, screamers like. Yeah, by yeah. a director I really, I really like. You know, he's the one that did uh, Thirty Days of Night, which is my David favorite Slade. favorite vampire movie of all time. Well, wait Whoa. a minute. What? We're, okay, hold on. Okay. This is a Philip K. Dick podcast, everyone. But hold on, I'm going to put Larry on trial here. Excuse me. David Slade um, directed Hard Candy, which is a great movie. Yeah, also a great right. movie. It has yeah. Patrick Wilson, so that that does make it pretty great. All right, we're getting into very, very far from Dick. I would say for my Dick-like suggestion, um, and I actually did think about this ahead of time. Well, it, you created the segment. Yes. <laughs> I would say City and the City, the City and the City on BBC. It's a brand new series based on the China Mieville novel, um, which is his most Philip K. Dick influenced work and it doesn't have the verbose kind of over the top writing that the novel does, which kind of turned me off and, but it has the awesome noir um, procedural story in the like weird setting of two cities that exist in opposite dimensions on top of each other. It's a really cool show. Um, only four episodes. You said that was a BBC show? Yeah, it's a BBC show. Okay. So it's kind of hard to track down, but uh, it will be eventually on BBC America. And if it's not, at BBC America on uh, Twitter and tell them they should bring it over. But yeah, it's uh, City in the City by China Mieville turned into a TV show. So, All right, that's, that's it for um, Dick Like News. Now, uh, or Dick Like Suggestions, sorry. Um... So, one of the things we want to do, so we are going to get into Solar Lottery, but we want to talk about, we want to set the stage for when this book came out, when it was written, because I think it's really important to think about that when you're talking about books from a classic era. This book was released in 1955, long time ago. So, I looked at David, up, David. Yeah. What was happening in 1955? <laughs> Well, it's important <laughs> that you should ask. In 1955, the average rent for an apartment was $87. A black and white TV was wow. $99. was the most expensive, or was, was a average price for a TV. What was the minimum wage back then? Like a dollar? It was pretty low. I don't have that. Um, England started its first TV station in 1955. The first pocket radios were invented in 1955. Disneyland opened. Uh, the polio vaccine was created. The Warsaw Pact was started. And here's a here's one that's really interesting to think about. That was the year of the Rosa Parks bus incident. So think about that when you think about all the political issues and things that this book brings up. This was the, this was the year when Rosa Parks was fighting to be able to sit in any seat on the bus. And you think about, like, just how much, you know, different the world was 
when Philip K. Dick sat down to write this book, which actually was in 1954, but when this book came out, uh, when it was unleashed in the world, that's, that's kind of like setting the stage for that time. So, Solar Lottery, we're here. <clears throat> so, uh, Anthony, you want to introduce the, read the back cover copy for Solar Lottery, the vintage edition? Sure, David. <clears throat> First prize was the Earth itself. The year is 2203, and the ruler of the universe is chosen according to the random laws of a strange game under the control of Quizmaster Varric. But when Ted Bentley, a research technician recently dismissed from his job, signs on to work for Varric, he has no idea that Leon Cartwright is about to become the new Quizmaster. Nor does he know that he's about to play an integral part in the plot to assassinate Cartwright so that Varric can resume leadership of a universe not nearly as random as it appears. Alright, so... Solar Lottery was published in 1955, and although it's Dick's first published novel, it's actually the sixth novel that he'd written. Uh, the first being Gather Yourselves Together, which actually wasn't published until 1994, surprisingly enough. Um... It has two alternate titles. The UK title, which was what, David? Uh, quiz, oh, the UK title? The UK title. Was A World of Chance. Right. And his, uh, oh, Dick's, or, yeah, it's a pretty boring title. <laughs> and, uh, Dick's, Dick's title for it was originally Quizmaster Take All. And that's kind of a goofy title, but I kind of like it. And, um, it I, was. I think, I think, uh, Solar Lottery was the correct title. No, it's yeah. it's a good title. Quizmaster Take All So Pulpy. Um, mm. It was also published as an ace double with uh, Lee Brackett's The Big Jump, which I haven't read, but uh, David, I, I know that you're familiar with that novel. I'm familiar with the novel. I looked up some things on that novel. Uh, I have not read The Big Jump, but I have read Lee Brackett before. What's interesting about um, Dick being uh, put together with Lee Brackett is Lee Brackett was mostly known for space opera and sword and sorcery type novels. Mm -hmm. She's most famous for having written the first draft of the screenplay for The Empire Strikes Back shortly before her death. In fact, she wasn't able to write um, subsequent drafts because of her death. It's interesting to note that The Big Jump was... It, it, it was, you know, the, the more sought-after book because it was... It was thought to be that Phil K. Dick was in a good position by be sharing a book with Lee Brackett, who right. was well known science fiction writer. Now, and uh, well, like I was, like I noted too, it's interesting because they got paid fifteen hundred dollars, which was then split between the three of them. So it's about seven fifty for the books plus royalties. Right, or between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Now the big jump is not a uh, super space opera like um, it. The description that I read uh, online was the novel begins with the entire solar system waiting for news of the first successful interstellar expedition to Bernard's star, real star, a mission named the Big Jump, and only one crew member, Ballantyne, returns half dead and with a body so changed he's barely human, which is a, you know, interesting sounding book. And it sounds very Twilight Zone. Right. But what's interesting about it is Lee Brackett is mostly known for space operas, but this was kind of a kind of horror, like psychological type twisty sci-fi thing. I think it sounds pretty interesting. I, in fact, I'd like to read it. I'd read it. Yeah. Um, Lee Brackett's most famous or most critically acclaimed novel is one called The Long Tomorrow. And I am planning on reading that coming up. So, but this ace double, and this was the, um, 103rd Ace Double. But you have to keep in mind at the time, Ace Doubles were the, like, primary science, like, home of science fiction books. They sold a lot of copies. In fact, until the Blade Runner tie-in edition of Do Androids Dream Electric Sheep, this copy of Solar, Lo Solar Lottery with the Big Jump was Phil K. Dick's top selling book. Which is kind of sad, but um, at the same time, they know that they sold 150,000 copies, which is not a lot, but for Philip K. Dick, um, that was as, as much as it had, had happened before his death. Some things about the writing of Solar Lottery. He, Philip K. Dick, had just spent a lot of time trying to sell 
a novel that he'd recently written, a mainstream novel called Voices from the Street, and a re-edited version of his first novel, Gather Yourselves Together, and he was very frustrated that they had not sold when he decided that he was going to write another science fiction novel. He had written, I think, two or three before that, and he was very influenced by the work of a Canadian science fiction writer named um, A.E. Vagat. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It's V-O-G-T. Van Gogh was um, absolutely uh, PKD's biggest influence at the time. In fact, I have a quote that here that he did an interview. He said, and I quote, when I wrote Solar Lottery, I modeled it after A.E. Van Vogt. Vogt. <laughs> I modeled it deliberately on him, and I have no shame, because he was my hero as a writer and as a person. I wrote a Vogtian novel. It's not. I was not an original writer at the time. I was a very derivative type of writer. I had heroes, and I tried to write like they wrote. So, I mean, he straight up said it. Now, if you look at um, some of Vagat's um, books online, if you look at some of the descriptions, and I've never read any of his work, they really do sound like Phil K. Dick books. Especially, there's a novel called The World of Null A. And The World of Null A actually turned into a series, but um, this is the description that I read on Wikipedia. Um, Gilbert Gosain, a man living in an apparent utopia where those with superior understanding and mental and mental control rule the rest of humanity wants to be tested by the gi by the giant machine that determines such superiority however he finds his memories are false his search for his real identity he discovers he has extra bodies that are activated when he dies so that in a sense he cannot be killed and a galactic society of humans exists outside the solar system a large interstellar empire wishes to conquer Earth, both Earth and Venus, and he has an extra has extra brain matter that, when properly trained, can allow him to move matter with his mind. Does that sound like a Philip K. Dick book? Sure does. Yes, it does. Yeah. So, yes, he was very, you know, and it's funny because a lot of us like to think of Dick as being super original, and yes, he has books that are not like anybody else, but until I read this, I didn't realize how much Solar Lottery was playing with a pastiche of an existing writer. Almost like, you know, the writers that do the kind of Lovecraftian pastiche. And, and that, Stephen King in his early works. And right. A lot, of, a lot of good writers start from emulation and work into their own style. I mean, you got to work through that before you really, I think, get to your own voice. Right. And now yeah, some... Bukowski stole from uh, Hemingway and... Saline. Yeah, yeah. So, but here's the interesting thing is that this was not his first science fiction novel. He had already written Cosmic Puppets and Vulcan Hammer, right? And so, I'm not sure, because we haven't read those yet, we'll get to those. But if they have a more original kind of feeling to them, it was clear with this one, he knew what he was trying to go for, what he was trying to do in order to sell the book. And let's face it, this is the one that sold. And if you look at some of his quotes about Solar Lottery, um, PKD was not a huge fan of this book. He, he couldn't believe that this was the one that sold. Well, I think, I think a lot of creators have that problem. You, you, it's like when you get really excited about a short story you've written or a book you love and it turns out everyone's, you're like, yeah, yeah, I knocked it out of the park. And then the reviews come in and everyone's kind of like, what was this? But then you put out something, you don't think too much of it and everyone loves it. It's, yeah, I, I think, I think that as the creator of it, you have a different perception of what you're doing than an audience might. But yeah. I can see Dick getting frustrated with this being the one of all the books he's written. Solar Lottery is the one that sold the best. Well, and look, I mean, even... Because there's no three stigmata. No. Well, and here's the thing. Stephen King, for example, his first book that sold was Carrie. He already had The Long Walk in his trunk, which I think most of us would agree The Long Walk is a, a much better book than Carrie. <sighs> um, and, David, yes. you mean Richard Buckman? Yeah, well, <laughs> either way, 
you know, this was a book that he couldn't sell Long Walk for whatever reason, Carrie was the one that sold. Yeah. And so for whatever reason, Solar Lottery was the one that he was able to get out the door first. And uh, for good reason, it, you know, had a lot of positive reaction for uh, PKD, but uh, it's definitely a struggle for him to get there. Now, um, the person who bought Solar Lottery was Don Wolheim. And some some of you probably don't know who he is, but he's one of the most important editors in the history of the golden age of science fiction. He was a writer and who started in the pulp 30s, and he was the editor for the Ace Double editions. He did hundreds of Ace Double's books, and he bought pretty much every Phil K. Dick novel between the time that he started at Ace and eventually started his own company, which was D-A-W, Daw. And Daw was based on his initials, Don A. Wolheim. And uh, he was the man who made, who basically is the reason we're all sitting here, because he's the one that bought Phil K. Dick's books and consistently supported him. And uh, PKD even said about him, Don Wolheim was the only editor who risked buying Solar Lottery. No one else would take it. And if Don hadn't, you wouldn't have been able to identify me as a novelist at all. Had Solar Lottery not sold, I would have abandoned all attempts to write novels and gone back to stories. So it's a good thing he bought Solar Lottery. <laughs> and so uh, along down the line, he, he's the one that would change the titles. And so, um, and we'll get into this as each book comes along you know, why he changed the titles. And each time, like, you know, it's funny that, like, pretty much, you know, PKD would give him a title and Wolheim would just, you know, change it every time. <laughs> you know, uh... Well, but, you, have, you have to admit that, that Dick doesn't come up with very good titles for a lot of the short stories, at it, least. Excuse me, Galactic a, Pot Healer? Uh, <laughs> is the you, ultimate title. But you, you can see that from all, tears, all the stuff the that's been turned said. into movies, almost every single one of them has a title change. Yeah, although I, I, will, I would say that I actually like the title We Can Remember It For You Wholesale more than Total Recall. Yeah. But We Can Remember It For You Wholesale on a movie, movie poster title. is not going to work. That is no. not a title for a movie. No. Total Recall, though? That was. Okay, now, um, we're going to get to the actual, like, meat and potatoes of the book pretty soon, but we still have, like, a few things of note about its production. So if you haven't fallen asleep yet... Well, look, I'm... Ass- still a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming if you're out there listening to this, you like this nerdy detail. So, and if you don't... Uh, if you don't, why the hell are you listening to this? Yeah, because exactly. this is definitely a podcast to nerd out about Philip K. Dick. Oh. But uh, I got to give David a hard time. What's that? Yeah, it's your job. That's my job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Read, nerd. Yeah, okay. So um, in 1981, PKD said um, that his influence for Solar Lottery was French realistic novels that he was reading. And he said it's a, quote, slice of life thing. I had 45 characters in the original version. My agent made me throw out most of them. I wanted to do... I I would imagine that was a good idea. 45 different main characters. Yeah, and so he said, he went on to say, I wanted to do Dos Pesos USA right off the bat. Now, that was a book that was very popular around the time that was like one of the first like real epic novels that had tons and tons of characters. Now, I have not read it, but I have read about it when I was in college. And I know, for example, that that novel was a huge influence on John Bruner's sci-fi novels. Was that Dos Pesos or Do, yeah, Dos Pesos? Sorry, did you did, you, did he say Dos Pesos? I were, might you, were you combining languages? Okay, but anyways, uh, that book was a huge influence on the Nebula and the Nebula award-winning novel Stand on Zanzibar by John Bruner, who is a very similar writer to Philip K. Dick in that era, and uh, I do know that a lot of people feel that, like, Bruner nailed that influence 
Whereas I think, I can't imagine 45 characters in a short period of what Solar Lottery was. I, yeah, I couldn't. Yeah. It's the, the clusterfuck that would have been to read. So it sounds like the um, editing choices, I think he said his agent, well, he said his agent made those, made him take out all those characters. And I think uh, that was a good, good move. I think that is, oh, yeah, one other thing about the reaction to Solar Lottery is that one of the things that really boosted the bandwidth of this novel was a review of the book by Damon Knight. Now, that name might not be familiar to, to younger readers, but Damon Knight was a crucially important editor in the science fiction scene in the 60s. He was a writer from Eugene, Oregon, who ran several workshops, helped start the Clarion Institute, that a lot of science fiction writers came out of. Damon Knight uh, wrote for a lot of magazines, had very influential pull. He's most famous for having written the episode of The Twilight, the story that the episode of The Twilight Zone to Serve Man was based on. The um, It's a cookbook! Yeah, that was Damon Knight. And the punchline is in the title. Yeah, to serve man, yeah. And... So Damon Knight was a very influential writer, and he, a lot of people believe that he made Phil K. Dick's career by giving Solar Lottery an entire column in a magazine in Infinity. It was a magazine called Infinity at the time. It was a very popular science fiction magazine. But one thing that I thought was really interesting, because I, I tracked down parts of the review, and was the backhanded compliment that... Damon Knight started this review by saying, and I quote, Philip K. Dick is a short story writer who for the past five years or so has been popping up all over with a sort of unobtrusive chameleon-like competence. Dick creates a blurred impression of pleasant, small literary gifts coupled with a nearsighted canniness about the market. He writes trivial, short, bland, short, sort of story that amuses without exciting and is instantly saleable and instantly forgettable. I don't agree with that at all. Wow. I, Whoa. I would say one of the things I've I've come to appreciate about Dick's work in doing this podcast and my my idea of reading them all in order is I think Dick's ideas are not they're not bland at all. They're interesting. Well, keep in mind that Damon Knight's comments were made when he had a bunch of short stories and one novel. Fair enough. Right? And so his short stories were, like, um, Impossible Planet and Second Variety, Minority Report. These are... Yeah, the kind of, all, the, all those short stories are, are definitely true to the form. They don't, they don't expound lofty ideas or anything. They, they tell you a joke or, or a single character's story for couple days or something that they, they really were that simplistic and, and bland compared to the people the contemporaries back then making hard science fiction and outlandish stories on the on the uh both right. extremes well they would definitely fall in the middle of that what i thought was interesting about this quote was just how harsh it seemed it was and he felt the need damon knight felt the need to say this before he went on to write a page and a half about how awesome Solar Lottery was. So it was yeah, just Yeah, they really... used a thing back then called tempered praise. Yeah. And uh now we just gush and give standing ovations. Right. Well Dang, Larry, tell us how you really feel. Alright, so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It was interesting the reaction to Solar Lottery because that Damon Knight review is a lot of what Phil K. Dick credits for his career really getting a kickstart. And he also seemed really surprised by the reaction that a lot of people thought the book was pro-Marxist and that it was super left-wing, which he didn't intend to do with the book. That's really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, all right. We're going to take a break. Ooh, I like breaks. Pause yeah. for five
right, so let's get into the actual story. We've gone through all the nitty-gritty of what was going on in Dick's life, the reaction, those kinds of things, but let's talk about the actual book itself. Yeah, let's talk about that book I read a year ago. Yeah. Um, Woo! Hey, I read it a month ago. I've read uh, three books since then, so... Um, and I only listened to it, so... Ah, you listened to it on um, the audiobook version, Larry? Yeah, well, the uh, the version that's on YouTube. Yeah. How was it? it? It wasn't terrible, but I'm not much of an audiobook guy. So yeah. I just yeah. ran out of time. Okay, so um, the book takes place in the year 2203, and um, as the back of the book says, the ruler of the universe, which is kind of interesting phrasing, uh, but basically um, most of humanity in this book take, lives... In the solar system, but mostly on Earth and Mars is mm -hmm. kind of the idea there. And uh, there is kind of in the second half of the book, there is kind of a weird mission to the outer solar system. To find that nasty 10th planet. Yeah, the nasty 10th planet. They're looking planet. for the flame disk. So, um, right. And so the kind of the concept of the book was that in order to prevent uh, society from giving us an idiotic ruler or uh, somebody who might kill us all. <laughs> as well as that's worked so far. Yeah. yeah. To keep that from happening, all of society submits these cards, right? These... P cards. P cards. And they have all your vitals and your information and your personality and everything on it. And they are submitted to the quiz master, which in this case is quiz master Varric. And they're the current ruler of the universe, right? And um, they, every couple of years, they have this lottery where another leader is selected at random, and it's done by this twitching of a bottle, right? And um, <laughs> you read this a year ago, right? Anthony, you're I'm just, at me I'm like, just nodding along. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and, but, the, the kind of the most interesting Philip K. Dick twist to this is not only do you get elected leader, but for some reason, part of the whole being chosen as leader at random is that someone is instantly assigned the job to try and kill you, um, which happens with an assassin who's assigned to this task. And so, um, this assassin... Well, isn't that, doesn't that seem prescient, considering, you know, the, the JFK assassination happened, you know, just not, the, not shortly after this came out, but sort of a, a, in a period where we weren't having a lot of assassinations. Right. And Are you saying Dick was a precog, Larry? I, I would say Dick think thought he was a precog. Yeah, he definitely thought he was, but yeah. there was a lot of interesting things. If you factor in that this was 1955 when this book came out, so like Eisenhower was president. Yeah. And um, so, I, I mean, for whatever, whatever reason, it might be easier to assume that a book like this would come out of a time like now when we have Donald Trump as president. Um, Eisenhower wasn't particularly dumb um, comparatively, but you're right. We then went on to a President Kennedy who was assassinated. I mean, the dog's not comparatively dumb Yeah, at this point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, but regardless, what you're saying is the assassination plot thing. This was before we had a string of assassination attempts right. uh, before in the, the 60s. The modern view of assassination. Right. He, he, had, he was basically setting up a modern assassination. Right, and this happens in Solar Lottery in a sort of reality TV kind of way where everyone's kind of watching to see how the new quiz master handles, like, this assassination attempt, and there's this uh, security force that's kind of around the president, which is kind of similar to the Secret Service, who are all psychic, but we're going to get into yeah. the details like that a little bit more as we go on, but... Part of the whole, like, wow, look at what... I mean, we are talking 1955. I mean, black and white TV... Like, there was one TV station in England at this time. And if you're thinking about at this night, at this juncture, 1954, when Phil K. Dick sat down to write this book, 
he's envisioning this version of 2203. It's, it's really fascinating to see it through the window of the 1950s. Um, right, punch cards and all. Punch, yeah, exactly. And I think some of that outdated technology is one of the things that, you know, I actually really enjoy the outdated nature of the old sci-fi. And I know... Um, I do too. Yeah. Yeah, same. And I know, for example, um, one of my favorite writers is uh, John Shirley, and he recently re released some of his books from the 70s, and he had this one, Transmaniacon, and I know it really bothered John that the Soviet Union factored into the book in a really huge way. And he, at one point, had talked about editing the book to change it, and, and I just... I really was against that idea um, and, and told him so online that I really thought it should stay the way that it was because it reflects when he wrote the book in the 70s. Well, it's the, it's the Grease effect. Right. The, movie, the movie Grease is a good sort of campy portrayal of the 50s, but you know it was done in the 70s, so we have two histories that we get to look at. And it's the same thing with science fiction that, that dates itself, is that we get both periods that we get to look at what they're talking about and when they're talking about and what it was like when they were alive and writing. Right. And as science fiction where the world of 2203 as written in 1954 is something that would never come out of the brain of a writer at this time. And no. for that reason, it's a, it's a, it's a absolutely bizarro time capsule. And I appreciate that about all the original dick books. Anthony. Yes. Oh, I'm struggling. I'm struggling hard to remember this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you feel? I I, I, I how feel, do you feel like about the outdated nature of it. In what? In, in regards to what? Did you enjoy the outdated nature of the '50s sci-fi books? Yeah, I, I I don't I don't read or watch anything and think to myself, "God, this is so outdated." I try to put myself as best I can in the in the mind frame. <laughs> God. Damn it, David. Sorry, I knocked the mic. In in the the mindset of people of like if I was there reading it or watching it in that time frame. So no, the the, the dated fifties kind of feel of it doesn't bother me. What does bother me is in some of Dick's work where we refer to, you know, yeah. character yeah, you, you, know, you know what I'm going. Yeah. There's definitely I think a... Um, I think, I don't know if, I don't know, do you guys think that Dick was racist? Because I definitely think he was a misogynist, but I don't, I can't necessarily decide on whether or not I think he was racist. Oh, we're going racist. there already? Wait, wow. I mean, we're it's a little early. Here. A little uh, early. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm all about early. hot L takes little right early up front. I'm as a, as a full, full, full I'm not full saying, on racist. I'm not saying he was a racist, but do you think that there's some bit of... A reflection. I would say. I would say he reflection. reflects his time. Yeah. This, yeah. Okay. This was the year Man, Rosa Parks. I'm not trying to crucify Dick. All right. Damn. Okay, you're this, a bastard. This was the year that Rosa Parks had to refuse to get up on the bus. So all I'm saying is that when every time you mention an African American character, you refer to them as the Negro, I'm kind of like. Ugh. But that's an accepted term at the time. Un at the unfortunately, yes. Um, I. It, yeah, and then there's no justification for it, and and I actually don't think that. Well, happened. there is justification for it, but it's it's a being a person of your time it is justification enough. Well, yeah, okay, but so one thing that I should note is that I don't think that happened a lot in Solar Lottery. I, I don't I don't think it did, and I think we're getting later. I think we're getting later. ahead of it. Yeah, yeah, but <clears throat> okay, so um, I will say this. I, well, I do wonder, back to the idea of out-of-date out date science fiction, do you update the book in your brain when you're reading it? Do you picture it in a futuristic way based on your perceptions, or do you 50s it out? Do you, do you I, pulp it out? I, I do a little bit of both. I picture it in kind of like an alternate reality that's not quite the time I'm living in, but not quite the 50s, much in the way if you notice the movie, like, like It Follows has a lot of elements of where it could be in the 80s, but it's a contemporary movie. Yeah. I tend to do stuff like that, where it's set in an alternate reality. It's a little bit of both. That yeah, is, I don't... That is the I don't answer. stop in the middle of... 
in the middle of reading a book from the 50s and say, well, why don't they have cell phones? This Where's the milkman? What? <laughs> Has he shown up yet? Well... You do notice when, like, they have a printout or something and, like, you know. Sure, or, or when they make dated references, but I, I, it's the same way as if I'm reading a book in the 80s and somebody from that takes place in the 80s and somebody mentions an 8-track. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and some of that stuff, I mean, I don't think that stuff should ever be taken out. Like, for example, I know in I Am Legend, the, the Richard Matheson novel, the great nuclear war of 1978 that's mentioned in it. Yeah. Like, I don't think that should be taken out because that was... When Richard Matheson wrote I Am Legend in 1954, the same year that Solar Lottery was written. Um, hey, Escape from New York takes place in 1997. Yeah, exactly. Wait, yeah, it's 97? Yeah, 97, yeah. yes, it does. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that stuff, well, and we're actually in the year, we're one year away from Blade Runner, I think, aren't we? Like, they already launched, and according to Blade, Blade Runner lore, they've already launched the ships to Alpha Centauri. And, right. And whatever. But anyways, <laughs> we're getting way nerdy here. So, um, yeah, I think that the how you read this is going to be very important for our listeners. And I think the idea that we're trying to put forward is that you should be doing a little bit of both when you're reading these. Because I'm sure some of you out there, like, maybe Solar Lottery is as early, well, it's as early dick as you can read. And if you've only read his later books, maybe you haven't seen one quite as is old school, but I think that the proper way to read it is to update it in your head a little bit, but also, like, kind of do that 50s charm kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely think that's the way to read it. I don't think any of, for the most part, any of the adaptations did any of that. Uh, Scanner Darkly a little bit? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would say Scanner Darkly does that. Because um, I don't think you can really tell when or where Scanner Darkly is set. And partially that has to do with the animation style. But, yeah. yeah. Which was so... Oh, that was great. Yeah. yeah. So I think everybody here loves the Scanner We Darkly. love ourselves some Scanner Darkly. We have, and unfortunately, that's going to be like our last episode. <laughs> <laughs> or really close to like two or three episodes from the end. All right. So um, by then, we'll be really good at this. So, and, uh, and I'll have more to contribute because I won't be trying to discuss a book I read almost a year ago. Yeah, you might have to start rereading them. I think I'm going to have to, because I'm like six, five or six books ahead of you guys. Yeah. So, um... You might check with a doctor, too, or you might have some memory problems. <laughs> My memory's perfect. All right, so <laughs> what I'm going to do is I've picked some sections from the book of things that I thought would, would really help with discussion, and I've got dog-eared pages, and I'll read parts, and then we can talk about them. So, um, this is from page 16, um, very early in the book, and the section, there's two sections that I wanted to read, um, and we'll stop and discuss each of them. So, this is directly from the book. In early 20th century, in the early 20th century, the problem of production had been solved. After that, it was the problem of consumption that plagued society. In the 50s and 60s, consumer commodities, and farm products began to pile up in vast, towering mountains over the Western world. As much as possible was given away, but that threatened to subvert the open market. By 1980, the pro-term the pro solution was to heap up the products and burn them, billions of dollars worth week after week. Now, that's some interesting thoughts about the future. Um, but it's also true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, not not in a, a a very specific sense. Like not in a literal in, sense. And not yeah. in a literal sense, but in the sense that there's um, uh, there's built-in failure in everything we buy. Right. So that there's there's a forced economy in that sense. Yeah, and so I really liked here that Dick was already talking about consumerism, and he's getting into issues, and you can see why some people thought he was a Marxist or a leftist when he has um, uh, basically talking about like this way of the future was subverting the open market and basically putting forward the idea that the open market just wasn't going to work. Um, yeah, that anti-capitalist sentiment. Yeah, that was so that was so hated during the fifties. Right, so during, this is like during McCarthy era, right? And he's talking about how the open market's not going to work, and consumerism is going to create all this junk that's going to be piling up. This is way ahead of time on environmental issues, 
and those kinds of things. And I just think it's really cool that Dick um, kind of works this into into the text. Now this chapter, and, this is, and he does it. He does it offhandedly. That's yeah. not the that's not the story that's happening. That's yeah. just a part of the history. Of now how we got to where we're we're at in the story. Now. Uh, here on page 16, there's a line that says, Mankind's lot, Cartwright observed, hadn't changed much of late. And then, this is a huge info dump <laughs> of world building, which is kind of against the rules in science fiction nowadays. That you want to blend these kinds of world building and info dumps into the story. But I think... Yeah, but it's a staple of early sci-fi and fantasy. Right, right. And at the time, this was normal. But... Um, and so here they actually talk about, like, I mean, there's just, there, this is where the world building starts. This is, like, the most world building of the book. It's almost like he gets it all out on page 16 and 17, and then it's like you're on your own after that. Yep. Um, and so, and it says word for word here, the quizzes helped a lot, a trifle. If people couldn't afford to buy expensive manufactured goods, they could still hope to win them. The economy was propped up for decades by elaborate giveaway devices, uh, dispensed tons of glittering merchandise. So <laughs> we're still living in that world now. <laughs> I know, but the, that's it's crazy. But, but specifically, he's talking about game show culture, isn't he? Well, to a degree. But what he's talking about here is that the quizzes. And I, when I first thought about this book, and when my my brain went back to this book, I would think of the quizzes as just being about who was the leader. But right. the quizzes are creating a situation of they're doling out supplies and consumerism and things along the way. Right. And, and I mean, Larry, game shows, yeah, I think specifically he's talking about game shows more or less, but that's just our culture in general, right? Right. Well, yeah, and so let's see. There's some other things that he says here. The disintegration of the social and economic system had been slow, gradual, and profound. It went so deep that people lost faith in natural law itself. Nothing seemed stable or fixed. The universe was a sliding flux. And that's when he starts getting into the theory of Minimax, mm -hmm. which I know uh, you looked up some stuff about too. The M game, a kind of stoic withdrawal, non-participation. Now, the Minimax, for those of you who don't know, is like a theorem of uh, strategy, basically. It's almost like looking at international politics in the way you would a chess game. Like, it's a game theory. Yeah, it's a yeah. game theory of... And basically... It's, it's a... What's his name? Joshua in War Games. Yeah. That, so that the same concept. Right. So what a lot of people were worried about in the 50s, of course, was nuclear war. And so a lot of people tried to view nuclear war through this mini-max endgame theory. Like, who could win? Who could come out of this? And so what, what really... It, um, so here there's a line that says, Mini-max, the method of surviving the great game of life, was invented by two 20th century mathematicians. And he has their names. And, uh, it had been used in the Second World War, in the Korean War... And in the final war, that's <laughs> the way Dick puts it, military strategists and their financiers had played with the theory in the middle of the century. Von Neumann, who's one of the guys who created it, was appointed to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, recognition of the burgeoning significance of his theory. And in two centuries and a half, it had become the basis for government, which means that he sees the Minimax as, like, a whole, like, the quiz and all of that is all an outstretch of the Minimax and the Final War. Right? So, there's a lot to fucking chew on here in this two pages of world building, and that's where it all happens as far as, like, setting up the universe of 2203. So, I, I don't know. Right, not... Go ahead, Larry. Not not huge as far as info info dumps nowadays <laughs> go. It's only no. two pages. It's only I mean, two pages, and I think anybody that's read a George R. R. Martin novel knows oh, that God. those info dumps can go on for chapters. Right. And chapters. Yeah. Chapters. Right. Um but and 
to be fair, though, I mean, we're taught nowadays when we write science fiction to blend world building into into, into every facet of what we're doing instead of yeah instead any of, sort of info dump. Instead of doing two pages of info dump, you do... You blend it into the background. Yeah, you yeah. have one line here, one line there, yeah. that kind of thing. You let your audience kind of figure out the world as the story goes along. Yeah. And, and look, there's beautiful ways to do info dumps. Uh, one of the greatest info dumps of all time, of course, like the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark when the two government men, when Indy explains the government men what the Ark is. Yeah, I think there's like, cool and creative ways to do it as yeah. long as it's, an, as long as it's interesting and it's not just page after page after page of, like, you're reading a history book. Right. And I yeah. think this world not building here books. in Solar Lottery works. And I think it's really good. And I think, actually, in a lot of ways, it's one of the best things in the book because there's so many ideas to chew on in just these two pages. And it just shows you how much PKD was thinking about international politics in, in, in 1954. And I'm sure this went way over the heads of most of the people that were picking up the ace double with the guy holding the boulder <laughs> on Mars in the yeah. spacesuit. Yeah, with the tagline... First prize was the Earth itself. Right. Pretty cool. Well, and actually... Great first, tagline. Yeah, first prize of the Earth Ridiculous. itself isn't actually that far off of this world-building aspect of it, but... There's a there's a bunch of different covers for this book. I don't know if you've seen them. I've been trying to post more of them on social media, and I think probably the coolest one is that almost Clive Barker-esque The one that's photo like the, the black background? Yeah, with the yeah. different faces melting into one. Yeah, that, so... That was pretty cool. Well, um, definitely, if you are listening to this online or on SoundCloud, we won't have this, but I'm sure Larry will use all those covers um, when he makes the video for the video version on YouTube. Well, I will now. Well, uh, it's a good idea. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so th I think the world building here is, is definitely one of the strengths of, of this book. Um, compared to other Phil K. Dick books, um, yeah, I mean, Man in the High Castle is a masterpiece of world building all over the place, and it's thread throughout the book. And and in that, in that sense, like, he hadn't gotten to his full potential at Sol in Solar Lottery, but I really like that. I but really it, and it, it's in a different way in, in Solar Lottery. Yeah. In the future, it's much more how the, how the mind... And there, there's some... Of course, there's some mind stuff later in this book, too, but the... Um, in the mind stuff. Mind stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be real specific here. Mind stuff. And you stuff. can't you can't whisper on a podcast. <laughs> All right. Anyway, stuff. <laughs> in the future, the world building comes out of what what's going on in people's brains, instead yeah. of what's happening in the actual world. Right. So there's a real disconnect between world building and character building okay. in the future. Now, I know most of you out there listening to this are doing something. You're probably cleaning or on the treadmill or whatever. But, Getting dim gains. Yeah. But if you are sitting there with your copy Don't of Solar Lottery. Don't skip leg day. Yeah. If you're, uh, <laughs> if you're sitting with your copy of Solar Lottery, I'm going to give you the pages before I do any of the reading. So we're going to skip ahead to page 37, okay, for the next part of our discussion. And I'm going to. This part really talks about what leadership, um, how it speaks to leadership today. So, uh, let's see. This is straight out of the book. Um, nobody can gain power and hold it. Nobody knows what his status will be next year, next year, next week. Nobody can plan to be a dictator. It comes and it goes according to subatomic random particles. The challenge protects us from something else. It protects us from incompetence, from fools and madmen. We're completely safe. No despots, no crackpots. So I think there's a couple things going on here. So it's talking about the randomness of it, that you can't really, like, you know, get too... Pe like to at peace with your power because at any time the bottle could twitch and you're no longer the quiz master. You're no longer in charge. And also this, the challenge that they're talking about is the, the um, assassins that are sent to kill you. And I think part of it is the idea is that these assassins are testing your ability to 
lead and protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you um, lead through survival. And right. And so right now, you know, we have a system in our government here in the United States, at least. And, you know, Dick was a U.S. writer where the Congress and the Senate gets all this increased power over time because they're able to control the lobbies and so on and so forth. And then we have the three branches, all that. What this is doing is keeping everything completely random. And I think the idea that Dick was like trying to suggest was that, you know, that this is a better alternative. So people don't, uh, you know, they're incapable of taking advantage. Right. Which is kind which of, which is a, sort of not true as it turns out in his own system. But right. Yeah. Um, people are able to kind of game it. But it's not, it's not supposed to be that way. And, and this was supposed to, the idea was that it was supposed to prevent these things. And for many years it did. Sure, but it's the idea that the system is incorruptible, but it ends up that it is. Yeah. Just like anything. Right. And I, I don't think for any of these, you know, this is obviously not a utopia, right? right. So something's going to go wrong. Um, Plus, that was some really great wackadoo pseudoscience there. I like that. Oh, oh, that, that, that it's just random particles and that it... That yeah, it, random yeah. I want to vote that we start a new segment on this podcast called Dick's Wackadoo Science. <laughs> Wackadoo pseudoscience, I believe I said. Yeah. Oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, and let's talk about that. He didn't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. He doesn't give a fuck about the science. No, yeah. no. He'll no. get it wrong. He doesn't care. But I almost... that. Sometimes that'll bug me, but with Dick's work, I don't think I care so much. No. I love the idea that there's a there's there's a group of people whose job it is is to cycle in and out of this kind of AI body with their consciousness. Right, right. We're, we're gonna That's get to one that. of the coolest things about this book to me. Oh yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. I have. Yeah, and, and so he, one of the funny things, well, and that's the funny thing about his lack of giving a shit about science is that when he does do something like, uh, when he names an actual star that's like an actual star system, like in, a, in the book, I'm like, whoa, like, he actually looked that up. <laughs> right. <laughs> or he actually knew that was a real star. And I think it stands out because, like, a lot of times, like, he doesn't give a shit. But... At the same time, almost all of his planets and all of his stories are like Tau Cetis and and Alpha Centauri's and like mostly he he uses ones that were that were real. So, um, and one thing you, you might notice in our discussion of this is I'm not getting into nitty gritty about the characters. Uh, Ted Bentley, um, uh, Varric, uh, Cartwright, like they're all pretty. They're not very strong characters to me like in this particular book i don't think that's I, I a think highlight they're of the book. caricatures right you have you know, the, the protagonist the antagonist well and those aren't even well really, soulless yeah. assassin yeah those aren't even really super clear um you know because you have Bentley, who's the researcher right and the quiz master is Varric, and Varric kind of loses his gig and then it's all about him trying to, to get it back right yeah and so he's kind of the corrupted power but none of these characters are like really you know they're not fully realized people i don't think no no I, I, I think they have very one note motives yeah but one of the things and i don't know if david had planned on getting if you've planned on getting to this is it we should discuss there's like two different books in one in here there's what's happening with the quiz master and the assassins and there's also the group of people who are trying to find the flame disc now i've i did a little bit of research and one group thinks that the kind of the subplot of them looking for the disc and i can't remember the character's name at the moment um they're searching for him hold on yeah searching for that uh what's that character's name Uh, it's john something I think. Anyway, while David looks that up, I I, I kind of want to put it out to you guys. Do you? I like that subplot. 
with the flame disc. With the yeah. flame disc, even though I don't know if it really works for me in relation to the kind of the main story. What do yeah, you, how did you guys feel about it? I like it on yeah. a very surreal level, but for me, I don't know if it. I don't really know if it makes the main story better. It doesn't. It doesn't really jive with the main story. No, but it's a good. It, it's good. Uh, it's a good story. I. I don't. Yeah, it doesn't really forward or advance the plot much. Um, I like that it put it out. It's. In, it's in sort of a, a, a philosophical more. bent on the whole thing. Yeah. Right. You know. So it's. I, I, or maybe maybe it functions as a for some. I think maybe it functions essential. as a metaphor for the main story. And what was the purpose right. of the flame disc? Mostly, it was like the idea was that it. Um, that it, it subverts the bottle is that like me uh, no remember <laughs> to be one hundred percent honest. <laughs> you, you definitely need to reread. Yeah, the I'm struggling, you guys. Before. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'm gonna have to reread all the other ones. Wow. Yeah. So, um, or at least skim them. No, I, I need to reread it because uh, I I need to. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no way around it. All right. So um, the next thing that I kind of had a note on is that there's more Minimax talk on page 59. Um, and Every this, time you say Minimax, I think of a tiny VHS player. So one. do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's what it's called. So, um, so there's a line here. It says, our whole system is built on Minimax. A bottle forces everyone to play a Minimax game or be squashed. We're forced to give up deception and adopt a rational procedure. There, and then another character says, there's nothing rational in this random t- twitching. That's Varric. This is after he lost his gig, right? Um, how can random machinery be rational? So once he, he was okay with the randomness when it made him Quizmaster, but now that he's not Quizmaster anymore, um, yeah, he's pretty upset about the randomness of it. That's yeah. very human. That's very human. Um, and um, this scene is, is really important to the story because this is where, um, you know, we start to see the cracks and the questioning of um, the ability of the quiz to pick the right person. And we definitely see our character seeing that. Um, and... Yeah, so I think it's an important part of the book, but I think the um, the debate between randomness and um, predestination is definitely that's an early Philip K. Dick theme that we're seeing right here. Right, and um, I think the this is a, just a very important page for the crux of the themes and the ideas that Philip K. Dick. We'll be exploring later. I mean, he's just really introducing him for the first time here, um, in a novel, I should say. But uh, in a yeah, in kind of a bumbling way. <laughs> yeah, it's, right. It's definitely not a not a clear concept at this point. It's mm. it, it's sort of a a pretend machine uh, spout, uh, you know, and someone spouting out ideas that don't really relate to it, but kind of do. I don't know. It, it, to me, that again, I was just listening to it, so paying attention wasn't wasn't great at that part. But okay. uh, it it just seemed like a like nonsense to me when I was listening to it. Right. Well, and and um, you know, for me, that I think the idea that um, you know the just the the whole idea between the randomness and and then that is is very important to the the theme of the book and. And um, the whole concept of a, of a of a lottery picking leader, you know, is when we really get into that. So, anyways, moving on, um, page seventy. This is where we're introduced to the assassins. Um, and this, to me, and we briefly talked about this already, but this is the neatest G whiz idea of the book. Is that? So we have these assassins that have the job to kind of take out the quiz master, <coughs> um, test the quiz master, and uh, so, and this is a really early time that we see the themes of um, Philip K. Dick introduced. This is page seventy, and this is the end of chapter six, and um, so you have. Uh, Varric, he screamed, pulsing with terror and mindless panic. Who am I? 
your your Keith Plague, uh, Varric Keith ans- Peleg. Peleg. Keith Peleg, Varric answered irritably, wiping his forehead with one impressive paw and pushing his tapes away. You're an assassin picked by the convention. You have to be ready to go to work in less than two hours. You have a job to do. So he didn't even know who he is or what his job is. But he's already the assassin. And the whole reason why we have these assassins, um, and this is the cool thing of the concept, is that the quiz master is protected by telepathic cops. Right? So how do you beat a telepathic cop that can hone in on and track you down and find you is that you have an assassin with 24, 24 personalities that randomly move in and out of the avatar body. Yep, pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool. This is true. Yes, this is the neatest fucking idea of the book. This could yeah. be, this could be, a novel in itself. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, if you had like, you know. In, in a lot of ways, like, if I was going to do the movie a- adaptation of this in 2018, mm-hmm. I would focus on this aspect. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, we can talk about that once we're done. We'll, we'll get yeah, to that. We'll yeah. get to that. Yeah. But that, this is the aspect where you have the the most interesting part of the story is that you have this leader who's chosen at random, doesn't necessarily want to be there, and then is suddenly the target of assassins who are engineered to defeat psychic cops. I mean, yeah. this is fucking cool. This is the coolest part of Solar Lottery. Yeah. It's not on the back cover. It's not not like the main focus of the, uh, of of where the story is, but it's it's Although I will say the back ad copy does promise a more action-packed book than you get. That may be true. But yeah, they, most of the action takes place in the last like 20 pages or so. Yeah. And to me, like I said, this is where I would focus if I was going to try to make a movie that would satisfy audiences in 2018. I'm not saying I would totally do away with the other stuff. We'll talk about that later. But this this is a really neat idea. This is really um, kind of... Um, this this has potential for driving a fast-moving pace plot. So um, I, re- I really dug this. A um, psychic spy thriller? Yeah, because in the end, like, this is the, and this is the kind of thing that, that PKD had done a really good job of, um, introducing these kinds of ideas in these short stories, because all he was doing was the action. Right. He was doing, like, really short, actiony stories. And so what's cool is, is that he kind of came up with one here, this nugget, and he just kind of throws it away and, like, not to throw it away, but he uses it in a very short part of the book where it's not, like, the coolest thing. And to me, it is definitely the coolest idea of the book. And there's a line uh, eight pages later um, that I dog-eared. You said you wanted to know our strategy. Here it is. Once a teep, that's the telepathic cops, locks minds with the assassin, he has him. The core never lets the assassin break off. He's passed from one to the next along multiple rings. They know exactly where he's going, what he's going to do, what he thinks of. No strategy works. He's teeped constantly, right up to the moment they get bored and pop out, pop out his gizzard. So that's the whole thing of, you know, why they're not able to trace him and why they have the multiple assassins going in and out of the same body. And then there's a line I, I, I wrote down. They can trace his path, but not his velocity. They're changing uh, minds. And so that, that's just fucking cool. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, wait, oh, here's another line. At random intervals, we switch in a different mind, picked at random. Each mind has a developed, a fully developed separate strategy that nobody knows which mind is coming up next or when. Nobody knows which strategy, which pattern of action is going to start. The teeps won't know from one minute to the next what the Peleg body is going to do. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. It's probably the coolest part of the book. Yeah. So, um, so should we kind of, kind of push this a little bit towards the end, or? Yes, the, that uh, I have. Um, what you got somewhere to be? No, but I want to talk. It? I want to talk a little bit more about 
you know. Okay, I've got... Your feelings? My feelings. I have one more um, on page one. I'm trying to get David to stop reading quotes from the book, Larry. Go ahead, dude. Good luck. Uh, On page 189 um, is when uh, we get into the cheating of the game, and they kind of, like, start to figure it out. And this is kind of where it wraps up. And um, so they said, uh, Cartwright says, I played the game for years. Most people go on playing the game all their lives. Then I begin to realize the rules were set up so I couldn't win. Who wants to play that kind of game? We're betting against the house and the house always wins. Bentley says, that's true. No, there's no point in playing a rigged game. But what's your answer? What do you want... What do you do when you discover the rules are fixed and you can't win? You do what I did. You draw up new rules and play by them. Rules by which the players have the same odds and the end game doesn't have those odds. So this is this is just like, you know, they're they're coming to the whole conclusion that it's all bullshit. <laughs> you know <laughs> we, we gotta end it and we gotta subvert it. That's where the story ends. So that's that's solar lottery. Um, so so we'll just go around real quick too. Like, where did this rate for you on your Dickian scale from everything you've read? Um, I loved it. Um, I really did like it. I think I like it more now after talking about it for an hour. Um, and and kind of like analyzing the things. I'm not sure I would have liked it as much if I wasn't stopping to dog ear pages and to mark off paragraphs. Right. But because I was looking at it so intensely for this purpose of doing this podcast, I think I really kind of got into it. And, you know, you just really have to appreciate this was a guy who had really almost given up. Um, He had three science fiction novels. He'd written Vulcan Hammer, Cosmic Puppets, that he couldn't sell, that he in reverse sold on the success of Solar Lottery, but um, and had to go back and rewrite them a lot, from what I could tell. But um, you know, he was he was really giving up, and now we know from from the research that we did that he was basically taking one of his heroes' books and saying, like, I'm going to write something just like him, um, and you know, I'm going to have to read some of. Um, A.E. Vagat's work just to, to see did he do it better, did Dick do it better, and I think I, I mean, obviously he's the one who we remember. So, um, so, you know, so I think he probably did, but yeah, I think overall I I, I really like Solar Lottery. I wouldn't <laughs> put it in the pantheon of of my favorites, but um, I really appreciate it. Larry. Oh my God, he's yawning. I'm sorry. <laughs> some of, well, I was gonna say some of us get up for work really early, but you do too. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> I get up at five. So um, I think uh, it, it's definitely not one of my favorite books of his. Really, uh, it it drags. At least, again, listening to it and reading it are two different things. I can't sep- I can't. I can't call them the same thing. Okay. It's my own, my own problem. I know audiobooks are super popular, and I'm really good at being super popular and everything. But <laughs> yeah, you yeah. are, you are popular guy number one. Yes, exactly. I'm in all the clubs. <laughs> yeah. What was the back of that shirt you're wearing? Say something about barbecuing naked. Oh yeah, all the clubs. All okay, the clubs. Okay. 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 <laughs> the uh. uh there are some great ideas in here, but I think they're better explored in different works of his. I, I I'd agree with that. Although I I will say that I really enjoyed this. I think it sets the stage for themes that we will come to associate with Dick's work forever. Right. And I I, I thought it was really awesome to see those in like this early prototype phase. Yeah, and the worst Dick book is better than a lot of other books. So in the end, like even if they're not, it's not well, his best work. Well, there are some, there's a couple that I read that I don't, didn't like at all. Well, but we'll get to those. We'll get to those. We'll get to those. But I, I think, you know, for the most part, there, there's just so many great ideas here. And, 
there, there's a lot to chew on, and, and I appreciate that about Solar Lottery. I definitely... I can see what you were saying about Dragon. I didn't... I mean, I made... You saw I just went from page 78 to 189 on notes. Like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't dog ear anything between there. And, um, because most of the, and that's when we were getting into the flaming disc, the flaming disc. Right. The, that subplot. The, yeah. The flame disc, like that didn't work as well for me. That's why I think that I was like straight up, like asking you, like, what was the point of that? Because, like, it just didn't resonate with me as much as the Minimax stuff did and the, the quiz. Yeah, the, although I'd be right. interested there, to hear There's what, a philosophical tie there, but there's not an actual narrative tie. Right. I, so. I, well, that's what I said. It, it's, I think it's a metaphor. It's a metaphorical representation of the actual plot. But right. I'd be interested to hear what people, other people think. So if they want to. Yeah, they're welcome to tell us how wrong we are. Yeah, yeah. tweet at us uh, at Dickheads Pod. On Twitter, um, you can always write us an email. It's um, dickheadspodcast at gmail.com. Or you can follow us on Instagram. Yeah. We're doing can... that thing where we give all our social media, and even though we're not done. <laughs> yeah, so you you can let us know what you think, and definitely on the Facebook group would be a good place to start a discussion. Um, you know, tell us what you think. But um, I, 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 yeah, I dug it uh, overall. So I have a question for you guys. Yeah, and I'll go first because I have a question. But um, I was curious, like, who could you see directing this today? For me, I would like split the two storylines into two different movies, and I would have Danny Boyle direct the flame disc version, like part of the story, <laughs> and probably Ryan Johnson do the actual narrative. Ooh, Ryan Johnson doing Solo Lottery would be interesting. Um, yeah, but I don't want to take him away from writing and directing his own stuff. Um, However, indulge me, David. Indulge you, yeah. Well, Ryan Johnson would be an interesting person to do it. Um, yeah, okay, so if we're talking about how I would do Solar Lottery as a movie, if I was writing it now, like I said, I would focus on the... I would still have the Quizmaster thing, and I would still do that. I would still focus on that. But the main jest of the plot would be the... Or the, the main thrust of the plot would be the... the the assassination plot and uh, um, the psychic um, cops versus the um, the body switching assassins because that's where you're going to have an action drive and have that kind of thing. And let's face it, if you're going to make a Philip K. Dick movie at this point, the template for the ones that have worked are the ones that are kind of action driven based on these ideas. Sure. So if you're going to sell and you're going to get the budget to do science fiction movie on that since you're going to have to sell it on the action. And I think you can do that and still remain faithful to the concept of the story. And you do that by focusing on that through line. And then you blend in the world building parts with the quiz, with the end theory, with that, the mini max and all that you blend that in, in like touches and moments um, that kind of surround but I, I probably wouldn't even touch the flaming disc. So you so. should direct the adaptation of Solar Lottery is what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, if somebody wants to hire me to do it, I'll, I'm there. But right. um, but who would you choose? Who would I choose to direct it? Uh, Ryan Johnson's an interesting choice, but um, I'm going to think on that for a second. Um, well, you know, some of the best Philip K. Dick adaptations have come from people who don't traditionally do science fiction. Um so, like, Richard Linkletter did that awesome Scanner Darkly. Yeah, it's true. And you know what? If I could get him back to do more Phil K. Dick and do a Solar Lottery movie, I'd, I think I'd hire Linkletter. Well, that'd be interesting because I don't know if I've ever seen him do action. <coughs> that is true. That is true. So he might not be the best person for that. But but you never know. But you never know. Well, the remake of Bad News Bears, there's lots of action in Shut that. the fuck up, Larry. So for every Richard Linkletter <laughs> beyond Sunrise and for for uh, whatever uh, School of Rock or whatever, he, <laughs> yeah, he has he has those movies, but he def definitely has genius movies like I Scanner didn't Darkly. know he did School of Rock. So does that mean Jack Black will be the the Peleg Avatar? <laughs> no, well, <laughs> it's possible. You, I would not cast him. Who I would like a Rugger Hauer type. Would Rugger Hauer. Rugger Howard type, because he's too old to do it now, but... 
Yeah, somebody like that, or like um, Dave Batista would be an interesting. Yeah. Larry as Peleg. What do you think? I like Dave Batista. Dave Batista as Peleg. Uh, that would be no. Cool. I would uh, personally, I would like to see 1983 Terry Gilliam do it. But oh, I would still let Terry Gilliam do it. I hadn't thought of that. Terry Gilliam is an interesting That's choice. An interesting choice. That would make it much more fifties and surreal. If you wanted to do the, I, I feel like he would do it to its its true nature and with all the with all the weird mechanics. And but do you like think that. it'd be too goofy? Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. But uh, I'm okay with too goofy. So who would you have play Quizmaster Varric? Mm. I'm thinking Jeff Goldblum. Oh, man, you nice. took my <laughs> answer. Are, are you sure you're not He's just obvious. saying that because he was the game master in Thor Ragnarok? That might take because him that's, out of the Because running. that's where my mind went. Well, you know, I always want to cast Guy Pierce in everything. Hey, I like so, Guy Pierce. So Guy Guy Pierce, but I, I see Guy Pierce is more of a a Cartwright or a uh, Bentley. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I definitely think we're gonna have to do this for every book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Dream director and casting. This. Dream director and casting. We definitely know we should write it. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone hire us to write the screenplay for Solar Lottery. Yeah. And then we'll help you choose the people that need to work. Right. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be good producers, as, as and, you can tell. We and screenwriters. This is just off the cuff, too, if we really took time. Yeah, we could do pretty good. Um, yeah, I think, so Varric, um, yeah, Jeff Goldblum, I think the, the Thor thing might knock him out. Yeah. yeah, he might be too goofy. I think, yeah, like... Guy, I mean, the title of Quizmaster is pretty goofy. Pretty goofy. It is pretty goofy. But... Yeah. What if Ed Harris were Quizmaster? Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Like Ed Harris. He can play a mean guy, but he wasn't. He's awesome in Westworld. And not awesome in Geostorm. He's <laughs> 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 actually really bad at Geostorm. I may be losing my opportunity to cast him in Solar Lottery by saying Yeah, right. That. <laughs> but, but yeah, but you know, what can you do? It's Geostorm, you know. Five minutes till Geostorm. <laughs> Five um, minutes. All right, so uh, maybe it's time to wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Sounds uh, good to me. Hey, so... Wait, wait. I gotta say this now before I forget. I made a mistake on our episode zero, and yeah. I noted that there was one of the... One of the early Dick books was very Twilight Zone-esque, and I said it was the world Jones made. I was very wrong. It's not the world Jones made. It's the Cosmic Puppets. The Cosmic Puppets. Okay. I've okay. been dying to make that correction for a month. You know you could have done that on Twitter. Yeah, but I didn't. Okay, so, uh, since you've actually read it, and you probably don't remember it, but can you preview The World Jones Made, which is Philip K. Dick's second book, also an ace double? Because that's the next book. Well, no, you're, uh, you're wrong. The next book is The Man Who Japed. Uh, ooh, I got the wrong book. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah I'm gonna yeah, have to. Uh, it's the man who japed. The man who japed. And I promise everybody out there listening, I'm gonna reread it. Okay, so and I'm gonna actually. Damn, re-read. I got the world that Jones made. Although the world Jones I realize made is now cool. Audio, audio is not the way for me to go to retain information. Okay, so we're gonna have to get Larry on top of this one, next one too. So um, here's here's uh, okay. The the man who japed is next. But we're going to be back before that because we're going to do, in between um, the books, we're going to do movies and episodes of um, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams. That And what we're going to do is next, we're going to do Minority Report. We're all going to read the short story, and then we're going to watch the movie together and then walk. God through. help us all. That was Tom Cruise's, like, longish grunge hair phase, right? No, he didn't have long hair in that, I don't think. His is. I think you guys are. You go. I think you'll be surprised at the character Max von Sydow plays. Yeah, and I think you'll enjoy Tom Cruise's performance more than you remember. I act, so, I don't remember. I've never disliking Minority Report. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I have a problem with Lexus commercials, but yeah. <laughs> oh, oh no! Oh, this episode is going to be something because. <laughs> oh uh, man. <laughs> 
So just just rough to get, start. Just to give you a preview, I'm a <laughs> fan of the movie Minority Report, so um, uh, it should be interesting because someone here is not. Um, but I'll give you a hint. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so next time you hear from us, it'll be, uh, with Minority Report. So until then, I'm David. I'm Anthony. Larry. Yep. Lang Hang. I'm, I'm Lang, 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 I'm Lang, Langhorn K. <laughs> Tweed. Stay paranoid, everybody. Keep it paranoid. Keep it paranoid. I'm gonna Keep do it, it every time, baby. Keep it paranoid. Keep it paranoid.